They say when you wear Black Power Media gear, you can accomplish anything. You can play any and every position. Coaching, to kicking, to receiving, to running and juking. And, oh, my goodness. I see that again in slow motion. Get off me. Ah. And you're going to have a lot of haters coming at you. But what you got to do is you got to shake them off. Shake them off and get to your goal and accomplish it. And when that's done, it's a beautiful thing. I'm talking about going hard, extra, for that extra point. And when it's done beautifully, you're talking about touchdown. Oh, and the crowd goes wild and they're celebrating with you and everything. Man, let's see that again. Nice. Black Power Media, baby. That's how we do it. Now go to blackpowermedia.org and get you some of that gear. Power yourself today. Yeah. I mix what I like. I mix what I like. What I like. What I like. What I like. Yes, indeed. What's up, world? Welcome to another edition of I Mix What I Like right here at Black Power Media. Again, I'm Jared Ball. Very happy to be your host. There we go. Once again, back at you, back at it. Uh, Welcome on in everyone who's able to join us here live. Those who will hear and see this later, welcome to you as well. Make sure you like, share, subscribe. Join the platform if if at all possible. Follow via blackpowermedia.org. Do all of those things. Put this in your socials. All of that would be wonderful. Uh, That said, we want to continue our discussion from the other day regarding the Sudan and uh, the surrounding region and uh, and, uh, really throughout the diaspora. Uh, uh, And uh, to do that, we are going to return, bring or bring back once again our guest, Professor Nisreen El Amin, who among many other things is uh, assistant professor in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Toronto, where her focus is, her focus is on land, the connections between land, race, belonging, and empire making in Sudan and the broader Sahel region. She uses land and struggles over land as a lens through which to examine state surveillance of the Sahelian, of Sahelian mig- migration, as well as Gulf Arab corporate investments and in political interventions in Sudan and neighboring countries. Her full bio is in the show description already, and we welcome her back to the show. Welcome back, Professor Elamin. Greetings. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me back on. So as as I titled the show or in, in thumbnail, uh, I, I think it is that you wanted to come back and expand on a part of our discussion from before, the, and the link to that will be in the show description as well. Uh, and uh, specifically around race and ethnicity. Uh, so I'm happy to have a start there, and I'll just give you the floor to to uh, tell us what it is you wanted to come back and and then and elaborate on, and then we'll go from there. And again, welcome. Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, so I think I, I want to say I wanted to come back to sort of talk a little bit more about the historical roots of uh, racialized violence, really, in Sudan. Um, but also to give an update and to provide some resources for people who are interested in supporting um, people on the ground. Um, and so that's kind of my um, my agenda here, if you will. Um, right. And I guess I want to start off by saying, you know, I think um, in the interview we touched briefly. I mean, uh, Ni'mat Ahmadai um, very eloquently talked about um, sort of the ways uh, that the genocide in Darfur uh, that that kind of uh, the legacy of it continues, um, the kind of state violence against Darfurians in particular continues. And um, we talked briefly about kind of the the way that the construction, the way ethnicity has been talked about in the context of Sudan and and how that can sometimes be oversimplified. But I, I guess I want to make very clear that um, what happened in Darfur, which, um, you know, was basically a, a state sanctioned genocide that uh, started in 2003 that has longer roots in the sense that um, the Sudanese state has long used uh, repression as a way of quelling dissent 
um, against any kind of demands for political representation in, in government, um, but also um, to extract resources from peripheral regions like Darfur, uh, the Nuba Mountains, South Sudan. And I'll go a little bit into that history in a minute. But I just want to make clear that um, a genocide happened in starting in 2003. Um, and as Na'mat mentioned, there were um, millions of people who were displaced by it, who continue to live. And these are mostly um, indigenous Africans who are farming communities, so sedentary farming communities, who continue to be displaced in, in, in um, IDP camps uh, across Darfur, some cross the border into Chad. And I think, you know, given my own research, um, it's, I think, important to remember that these are people who grew their own food, who, um, you know, subsisted uh, in terms of their livelihoods, um, were a key part of the agricultural sector and are now uh, living in camps where they're, for the most part, dependent on um, assistance, humanitarian assistance. Um, even though people, I mean, I've visited Darfur, um, are still growing their own food when they can, but it's obviously not at the same scale. They've lost their land. So that genocide really, um, it you know, it killed over 300,000 people, and that's an underestimate, right? People now are estimating that it killed um, close to 1 million people. Um, and so I want to take us a little bit back to kind of Sudanese history and start by saying when the British left Sudan in 1956, their parting gift um, to the country was essentially an extractive um, export-oriented economy and a political system that really placed central um, Sudanese and northern Sudanese elites at the center um, who basically uh, continued to exploit the peripheries for its resources um, for their own benefit. Um, and so we saw in 1955, a year before independence, uh, the war, um, a civil war breakout, breakout um, in South Sudan, essentially, where um, South Sudan under the British was governed as a kind of separate entity and then subsumed under uh, the North with northern elites uh, in power as a quasi internal colony. And of course, people uh, resisted against that and demanded uh, sovereignty, political representation. And that uh, the response to that by the northern sort of Arab identified elites was uh, to start a war against uh, against civilians, essentially. Um, and so that's where we see the beginnings of a kind of um, really extractive war economy that had this kind of double um, purpose, which was to quell dissent in any of the peripheries, any demands for political representation um, and, and sovereignty and kind of um, access to people's own resources, right? Um, and then, of course, yeah, this continuation of an extractive export-oriented economy, which also in terms of the infrastructure that the British left behind is sort of still, you know, it's basically the, the best roads lead from the kind of agricultural center uh, to the port, you know, to take resources out. Um, and, you know, in terms of Darfur, I mean, basically you, you had these Arab identified nomadic groups that were competing with uh, indigenous Africans for land and water resources that was kind of intensifying due to desertification. And there had been clashes between them uh, for, you know, decades, really. But um, oftentimes those clashes would get resolved um, by a third party, sort of traditional forms of, of resolution. Um, you know, sometimes also there would be weapons coming in. And so there were definitely clashes, but not to the scale that we saw in 2003. And so what the Sudanese government did, instead of de-escalating that those kinds of conflicts, they armed the Arab identified uh, groups and kind of essentially um, developed, you know, propped them up as a militia uh, known as the Janjaweed. And they are the ones who uh, started, you know, um, essentially perpetrated a genocide against indigenous Africans in Darfur. Um, that really, you know, even after the, the world sort of forgot about Darfur, uh, really continued, the violence continued, maybe not at the same scale, um, but the two war general criminals that are currently fighting um, are, you know, uh, have blood on their hands, especially Hamiti, who is the head of the Janjaweed, now known as the Rapid Support Forces. Uh, these are the people responsible for the genocide um, in Darfur. And so I just wanted to make that clear. I hope that gives some kind of background. And I think the key point I want to make is that uh, in many ways in the U.S., Darfur was seen as separate from the rest of the country. Like people could actually identify Darfur uh, on a map, but not necessarily as part of Sudan. And what is problematic about that is that it then doesn't tie together 
the historical roots of the conflict and the way it's connected to the Sudanese uh, civil war, the second Sudanese civil war, for example, from 1983 to 2005, uh, killed over 2 million South Sudanese, um, uh, you know, and, and displaced uh, more. And so uh, we have to connect this kind of state sanctioned violence um, against um, primarily indigenous Africans uh, that is about, you know, sort of continuing this extractive war economy that um, elites in the center have been benefiting from since independence. I think you might be right on. Thanks for that. Yeah, sorry. Um, well, yeah, I, honestly, I'm not really entirely sure where to go next. Uh, I did want to ask one question that um, uh, that I got from, you know, because in trying to, to catch up to a little bit of what's going on, I um, went to the always trustworthy source of the Voice of America, um, where... Uh, I was told about an hour or so ago that the Russian backed Wagner group is largely <laughs> responsible for uh, perpetrating uh, uh, through abuses in Sudan, uh, a capture of resources for their own ignoble ends. Um, I'm curious to what extent that that is accurate uh, and how those in Sudan view th those arguments and what th this outside intervention to the extent that these reports are accurate impacts the history you're talking about there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I mentioned this briefly before. I mean, I think, you know, to be clear, this is not an externally orchestrated war, like some people have claimed that uh, you know, this is Putin's war and it's not. But um, what we've seen, and this even happened during, you know, the height of the revolution, where there were credible reports that the Wagner group was on the ground, sort of um, even sort of advising the rapid support forces. There was a massacre that was perpetrated in June uh, of 2019 that broke up a sit-in, a massive sit-in of about a million people who were from April until June uh, essentially stationed in front of the military headquarters demanding a full transition to civilian rule after the overthrow of Amr Hassan al-Bashir. And that was brutally um, broken up. Uh, over 120 people were massacred during um, during this, you know, uh, breakup of the sit-in. Um, and, you know, the uh, really the military regime, including the rapid support forces, were responsible for this massacre. And at the time, what people were saying was that they were seeing, you know, uh, sort of glimpses at least of the Wagner group on the ground uh, sort of uh, advising, um, you know, how to essentially launch counterinsurgency. Now, I don't have proof necessarily of this, but this is um, what people were saying. Um, what we're now seeing is that, I mean, in this transitional period, and as, as I mentioned, um, Hamidi, the head of the Rapid Support Forces, controls much of the gold trade in Sudan. We have a lot of gold um, and, you know, he's been able to kind of ship gold out through the United Arab Emirates who have then in turn, um, it's then ended up in, in you know, uh, it's been, you know, um, essentially, you know, ended up in, in Russia, if you will, or, in t t um, you know, um, the Russians have benefited from that gold trade, right? And that's partly how they've, uh, people claim they've been, you know, financing their war in the Ukraine is that they're enriching themselves through Sudanese gold, because um, if it comes out through the black market, they can make a big profit, right? So they can buy it from Hamidi and then make a profit, essentially, if that makes sense. Again, I mean, I don't have, you know, um, you know, proof of this per se, but there are credible reports. I mean, Ni'ma al baghir actually from CNN has made a film about this. Um, but again, I think partly I want to caution us against um, seeing them as too big of a player, because I think this is also partly what the U.S., wants, right? Um, there are many players uh, in Sudan, um, all of whom, for the most part, are interested in extracting resources and in undermining any form of popular democracy because of the way that it um, kind of goes against their own interests, if you will, right? And no, I, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I, 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 I'm, I, I don't mean to bring any brevity or my own childish humor to this discussion, because I don't mean to, at all to, to diminish what is a horrific situation for people there. 
But I was just what I really was just trying to have a little fun with was the idea that the voice of America was going to be telling people in the world that it's other people that are only interested in Africans for resources, yes. that it's only other uh, conveniently Russians who are interested in some ignoble intervention, whereas the United States and whatever it may be interested in is some sort of legitimate spread of democracy and freedom. Uh, so that's all I was. So I so I apologize. Yeah. I don't mean to. I didn't. You know. I. I. Yeah. Anyway. So. No. No. Um, I think that was a very valid question, and I'm glad that we brought it up. And I think yeah. you're right. I mean, this is partly what's happening is that you know the UAE, for example, and Saudi Arabia, you know, have uh, sort of, as I, I've mentioned before, they they they've invested about 27 billion in different types of real estate, land, infrastructure projects. Um, that in many ways, uh, in many cases, have actually dispossessed local people of their land, for example. Um, and, you know, uh, they're definitely, you know, um, interested here in maintaining um, their investments, if you will. And, and because those deals were uh, brokered with the elites that are in power and the military, you know, regime, um, they don't really have a vested interest in getting us closer to democracy. And of course, the U.S. is not going to criticize that because they're, they're allies in the region, you know. So and forgive if I'm inviting some repetition here, but I did want to go back to this question. So because, you know, some of the other reports coming out, are, of course, that that the the uh, as, I, as I read in one story, they even they thought it was sort of, I guess, necessary to remind us that that. South Sudan and Sudan uh, are still interrelated and, and what happens in one will if, affect the other. And that what is happening in Sudan is likely to or, or worsen the situation in South Sudan. Um, and I think for many of us uh, with a, a Western imposed view of, of the world and of race and identity, again, it has been, it's overly simplified that South Sudan are the indigenous Africans uh, and darker skin and Sudan is Arab and lighter skin and then that's it. Um, when I heard you talking earlier, you used the phrase, uh, I think you were saying uh, uh, Arab identifying, mm -hmm. which in, in, in again for me complicates that oversimplification that I started with, but could you could you elaborate a little bit more about, again, this issue of race and ethnicity and what the realities are there versus what many of us think we think is happening there based mm -hmm. on our own concepts of race and ethnicity? Yeah, sure. And I, at the end, I want to recommend some books on this. Uh, Professor Jok, Madhu Jok has written uh, many books. And I put your list in the show description, by the way, uh, okay, that you great, sent. Yes. So there's, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah. And he's speaking specifically, I think, to these issues of race and violence in South Sudan and the relationship between Sudan and South Sudan. Um, so, I mean, I think first I want to just say in terms of the current situation, um, Sudan actually, you know, used to host 1.1 um, million refugees, probably the lar one of the largest uh, refugee populations in Africa. Um, and the, the majority of them were from South Sudan because of um, instability and civil war in South Sudan. We had about 800,000 South Sudanese living um, in, in Sudan, um, but also, um, you know, many Ethiopians and Eritreans and, uh, and also like 95,000, you know, Yemenis and Syrians, which is the, the smaller uh, number here. But um, and so, you know, obviously what is happening in Sudan uh, has led to has forced many South Sudanese to have to return um, uh, to South Sudan, um, you know, and, and both in terms of the infrastructure set up to support them, but also, you know, it's, it's not, that's not easy, right? Um, and I think that's something to keep in mind because Sudan borders seven countries, many of which have uh, experienced state-sanctioned violence and instability, um, you know, the fact that South Sudan is no longer a haven for refugees is going to have a, a big impact. Um, in terms of the politics, I mean, again, this goes back um, sort of historical roots, but, um, and I, you know, I don't want to over, um, yeah, I don't, I don't want to sort of blame colonialism here, but um, as I mentioned, South Sudan was governed as a kind of separate entity under uh, colonialism, under under the British, and, and was purposefully underdeveloped during that time, and then sort of 
you know, after independence, the two countries were essentially put together with uh, this kind of central uh, northern uh, Arab identified, in some cases Nubian as well, um, elite um, at the center that has been exploiting peripheral regions, not only South Sudan, but also, um, you know, Darfur, the Nuba Mountains, the Blue Nile region. Um, and, you know, I don't have the exact statistics, but uh, I mean, for one, I, I, I identify as a black African, but there are lots of people who look like me who do not, who identify as Arab, right, who are Arab identified. And, you know, this is not to deny that um, I might have some, you know, uh, Arab blood flowing through my veins because of slavery, right? Um, slavery in Sudan was not abolished until the 1950s. Um, and so, you know, I have uh, relatives, great grandparents who experienced slavery um, and, you know, probably also uh, great, great grandparents who enslaved people. And so um, that is, I mean, I think that the, the, the heritage of many. Um, and for those of us uh, where enslaved descent is closer, it actually also um, impacts, you know, affects, um, it's a form of marginality, right, that uh, people in my own family have experienced. And so I think those are, uh, that's important. And, and the way in which, um, I mean, the slave trade has very long roots um, that has to do with sort of Arab settler colonialism. But I also want to point us to the Ottoman Empire, which um, is, you know, um, in the 1800s, sort of in the late Ottoman Empire, Sudan, you know, belonged to the empire. Um, there was an attempt, and this is partly, you know, I've learned this through my research, um, the, the, the Ottoman taxation policies really placed a burden on farmers in central Sudan and the agricultural kind of uh, region that's nestled between the Blue and the White Nile. It's called the Jazira, for example. I mean, also other parts, but I'm going to focus on that part because that's where I'm originally from. And so um, what it did is it caused many small farmers to go into debt and to have to uh, essentially sell their land to local landed elites. And those landed elites then needed people to work the land. And so it really fueled the already existing slave trade. And, it, um, and, and you know, the slave traders, many of whom were dispossessed small farmers, um, then went to the south um, and to other you know, peripheral regions of, of the country where the majority of people are indigenous Africans and enslaved people to work on the plantations. Um, and that you know, legacy continues. This is partly what I study. I look at the afterlife of slavery uh, in rural Sudan and sort of how it's impacted access to land and uh, sort of land rights and so forth. Um, and so that is part of it. And that's, uh, you know, a kind of backdrop to, um, yeah, the, the, the kind of this, this, the two phases of this uh, protracted Sudanese, uh, you know, civil war that, as I mentioned, killed over 2 million mostly South Sudanese um, because it happened on South Sudanese land, right? So, um, I mean, of course, yeah, that is, uh, that's why, I mean, I think that what happened in Darfur is connected to what happened in South Sudan, right? And mm -hmm. it's also connected to what, is, what has happened in other peripheral regions. Um, but, you know, the majority of Sudanese are, um, if I'm not mistaken, I'd have to look at the new statistics, you know, post-independence uh, of South Sudan, but are indigenous African. Um, and so, you know, I think we have this kind of false idea that the North is all um, Arab identified, and it's definitely not. They're just... Uh, marginalized. It's a kind of marginalized majority, and it's in the peripheral regions of Sudan. Which, when I call, when I say peripheral, I'm talking about Darfur is the size of Texas. It's a huge area, right? Um, it's very underdeveloped because of these dynamics that I've been explaining. Um, but you know, we are talking about a majority here that has been uh, shut out of any form of um, political and economic power, if you will. Um, for the most part. And so even though that's changed slightly, um, but it's really more kind of in tokenized forms of power. Um, and so that's why you had um, nonviolent movements that turned into armed rebel groups because um, people, you know, are demanding, um, yeah, their rights, essentially, you know, political and economic. No, right on. Thank you for that. Um, I saw, you know, Big Teal is asking a question that I wanted to uh, bring up today as well, get some details on. Uh, are there ethnic identities in Sudan and what are they? The indigenous people, what do they call themselves? Uh, yeah, I wanted to also just just add uh, in general, you know, if, could, to give us a little bit more clarity, what, what um, to what extent that you can um, tell us what are the religious that religions that are practiced, what languages are spoken, 
what mm-hmm. are the so-called indigenous groups uh, and identities? Yeah. Could you tell us a little more about that? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I, I wish I had prepared so I'd yeah. have some numbers here, but um, I mean, certainly. You can always come back. You yeah. can always come back. Um, so, you know, I mean, I think in terms of, and this is one thing I should have mentioned. I mean, I think I bring up race because um, we talked about, you know, the sort of legacy of racialized violence, of enslavement. Um, and I think that is about race. But I don't think that we can necessarily impose the same notions of race onto um, a kind of Sudanese context um, as we might be familiar with uh, in the Americas. Um and, you know, there are books that have been written about this, so I'll, I'd rather refer to that. Um, I mean, there are m- very many um, ethnic identities, you know, hundreds and different languages that are associated with uh, each of these ethnicities. And for the most part, you know, I think the African-Arab identified divide is, um, I mean, it's complicated in the sense that people generally identify by their by their ethnic group, if you will, you know. Um, and and uh, people know which ethnic groups belong to kind of the more. And when we say indigenous, I mean, you know, I have Nubian roots and um, that means we are also indigenous to to um, Sudan. Um, but I think what, what really we need to be talking about is the way in which elites have mobilized race, race and ethnicity um, and even language, uh, you know, and a sort of uh, and a form of Islam that, um, you know, it's a kind of a, a, an ethno-nationalist, basically, uh, project um, that is tied to a form of Islam that is then imposed on a very uh, multi-ethnic, uh, also multi-religious country. I mean, South Sudan, um, since the secession of South Sudan, we've become perhaps a little homogenous religiously in terms of uh, the majority of people are, are Muslim in Sudan, but people practice different forms of Islam, if you will. And the majority of us do not follow the kind of, um, you know, Islamist uh, tendencies of um, certainly of this um, ruling elite or uh, regime, if you will. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's that's important. And there are also kind of indigenous forms of, uh, yeah, cultural and religious practices that are associated with Sufism and other kind of, yeah, just expressions of Islam, if you will, that, um, anthropologists have studied and that you can also read about. Um, but yeah, so I mean, I think I would describe Sudan as a multi-ethnic, uh, multicultural society upon which an elite has forced a kind of ethno-nationalist, um, yeah, like Islamist project essentially. And by Islamist, I'm not talking about, um, I'm talking actually about a neoliberal kind of Islamism, right? Um, I, I think that's it's always important to emphasize that in a U.S. context because I'm also not trying to fan uh, any kind of Islamophobic, um, you know, sentiments here. These are people who have hijacked religion for their own purposes to enrich themselves, to continue exploiting the peripheries, and to continue repression, repressing any kind of dissent or demand for a change to the political and economic system that is basically allowed them to stay in power for this long, you know? It's about elites and their control of of the rest of the country, yeah. Right on. Um, uh, I didn't, I don't know how much time you have today and uh, uh, and if others have any questions or comments they would like for you to address to the extent you haven't, but um, um, yeah, feel free to let me know what, what your time is like. Um, yeah, I mean, I- have a little bit some flexibility but i wanted to just sort of get to maybe the update and oh yeah I, yeah and I, so so okay so my last before we leave i was going to make sure to ask you uh specifically what would you like us to know and what would you like us to do but we can but yeah whatever you want yeah please let us know what's the update yeah yeah so the update is that um over the weekend um the two generals uh sent their representatives to jeddah where there was a u.s mm-hmm. saudi-led effort to negotiate what we are kind of still asking (laughs) because basically these were talks where peace was not on the table which does not make any sense in this context right how can you have a you know talks where uh, really the only outcome of this was um, the kind of signing of a declaration that essentially asked these generals to uh, you know reminded them to hold themselves accountable to international humanitarian law so um, and you know a U.S. official who was there said this is not a ceasefire This is a reminder to hold them accountable to international humanitarian law, to open up 
corridors for humanitarian assistance to uh, stop occupying hospitals and clinics where um, uh, to, to bury the dead. Um, and that's pretty much it. Uh, there was you know, no talk of a permanent ceasefire or even a, I mean, again, you know, the official said this is not a ceasefire. Um, and so, you know, this is hugely, I, again, I should say it's disappointing would be naive of me to say, I was not very hopeful, um, but it is very disheartening um, that the US and Saudi Arabia would bring representatives of these two war criminals back to the negotiation table when time and time again, we have been saying, do not legitimize them, do not, um, you know, negotiate with them, right? Of course, we know that they need to be pressured to stop fighting. And so uh, to the extent that that, you know, needs to happen, you know, perhaps, yeah, somebody needs to talk to them, obviously. But the pressure here should be, you know, freeze their assets, stop funding them through Libya and Egypt, right? Um, the external actors need to stop that kind of interference. Um, and, and we need to kind of, you know, put the pressure on by removing any access to the resources that are allowing them to continue fighting. And that was not on the table. What was also not on the table was um, the ways in which the Egyptian border has essentially been, um, you know, there's there's hundreds, of thousands of people who are at the Egyptian border who have yet, this is now we're in day week four, right, um, of this fighting, that have yet to be able to enter. Um, the you know they're saying that the visa processing is taking a very long time, but I think as I mentioned before, we have, you know, we've heard of. Um, young people who are healthy dying at the border because there is no humanitarian assistance they've had, you know, of a heat exhaustion, which is absolutely unacceptable, given that, you know, after the humanitarian sort of aid community left um, and or ceased operation, at the very least, they could be at the border. It's safe, you know, to be there, and they have not. Um, and while they have resumed some form of operation uh, in and around the capital, it hasn't really... Um, come to Darfur. And that's another thing about this declaration. It did not mention Darfur, where uh, violence has escalated and is continuing. And we need to keep our eyes on Darfur. And this is where I want to mention Ni'mat's group again, the Darfur Women's Action Group. Uh, support her. Support her work. Um, it's critical. Because um, the Americans, you know, the, the sort of the American-led initiatives that I talked about last time forgot about Darfur after a while. Um, and that, that has had a hugely damaging effect. Um, and so uh, yeah, I just want to emphasize that. But, you know, so that's kind of the update is that um, peace was not on the table. And for the foreseeable future, we're not sure if it will be. Um, and what I interpret what happened here is that the war criminals essentially got the green light to continue fighting. And the idea here is to evacuate people out of the capital and um, to basically continue as long as possible. And it's very difficult to get people out. The majority of people on my mother's side of the family remain in Khartoum and, you know, some in areas that I haven't been able to reach one of my uncles, for example, uh, for over a week now because electricity and water has been cut. He only has a very basic flip phone that he hasn't been able to, to charge. And so I don't know what's happening with them. Right. And there are many, many other people in the situation. Um, and so we're really, you know, and I, I, again, I want to emphasize Khartoum is a mega city like New York City. It's almost 7 million people. It's densely populated. And they are indiscriminately, you know, shooting and bombing civilians. They're using civilians as a human shield here. Um, and, you know, this has been happening in other parts of Sudan. It's come to the capital. Um, and it is just, you know, the world, I mean, Sudan is dropping off the headlines, right? It's no longer, if you look at CNN or, you know, uh, any of these other um, mainstream corporate media uh, outlets, Sudan has fallen off, in part because the focus was on the evacuation of foreign nationals. That was the story for the first week or two. And after that happened, it was almost like the underlying message of the focus on the evacuation of foreign nationals is that nothing else matters, that the most important thing is to get the white people out, you know? And that's just a shame, you know, because there are millions of people uh, still trapped in Sudan, you know, over 700,000 have um, you know been internally displaced? Over seven hundred have been killed. Over five thousand have been injured, and that's a, probably a vast underreporting. Um, so you know, it's uh, yeah, it's just devastating, really. And so, what I want people to do, you know, I want to um, just suggest that uh, there is a website uh, called EyesOnSudan.net where you can find links to local fundraisers um, that mostly go to the unions, a doctor's union, for example, that is providing 
life-saving uh, support at the moment at great risk to themselves. Um, you know, there are other initiatives that are really supporting the uh, groups on the ground, including the resistance committees. I would uh, urge you to support those Sudanese-led groups over any of the international, you know, agencies. Um, let's not repeat the mistakes that were made in Haiti, right? And just give it to the Sudanese people who will, your dollar will go a lot further, right? And you can find links on the eyesonsudan.net uh, webpage. Um, for news, I recommend Radio Dabanga. It's an independent news media that emerged out of Darfur, is, you know, run elsewhere, but uh, they provide English um, media uh, that is great. Um, and um, yeah, and so uh, that's, I think, one way to, to keep up to date. And of course, you know, social media, Twitter, um, you know, BS on Blast, Yusra al Baghir. There's a lot of people on Twitter at the moment who are giving Mohammed Hashim, for example, also is a journalist for the BBC. He's been giving lots of updates. Um, uh, so, yeah, I think there's a lot. I mean, I think the first step here is, again, educate yourself um, and then just support Sudanese-led initiatives and any calls um, from the resistance committees to for international engagement should should be heeded, you know, if they come. Yeah. Has the African Union been involved? I don't know. Did you respond to this already? What, and, and if so, how? And is, are there, are, is their involvement wanted by Sudanese people? Yeah, I mean, I actually put my faith more in these regional actors, the African Union, IGAD, you know, there were there were sort of the beginnings of uh, at least a conversation around peace talks in Juba, South Sudan, that were convened by the president of South Sudan um, that happened right before the Jeddah talks. And they got derailed by the Jeddah talks and the AU and well, IGAD really was, was uh, sort of heading that, was going to be heading that. And to me, what is, you know, the AU has not played the best role in this. I mean, certainly during the revolution, um, they would issue statements, but there wasn't much action behind it, right, in terms of um, really holding these uh, war criminals accountable, not putting them at the negotiation table. But at the very least, these are, you know, African um, institutions uh, whose capacity needs to be built, right? I mean, I think part of what's happened is that they've been undermined in the past to do their, their job. Um, and so I put my faith uh, more in them also because there is more at stake for them because Sudan borders seven countries and certainly, you know, for the president of South Sudan, uh, stability and peace. I mean, and this is something I didn't mention, but part of the connection between South Sudan and Sudan is that 75 percent of the region's oil resources, South uh, Sudan and Sudan, are in South Sudan. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but the pipeline that takes it out to Port Sudan goes through the north through Sudan. And so with what's happening, um, it's actually going to likely have a huge impact on the South Sudanese economy because they're not going to be able to get their oil out. Um, you know, there's, I mean, there's plans of other pipelines, that, you know, but I, I don't know what the progress has been on that. So, I mean, I think, you know, Ethiopia with the dam and Egypt, I mean, all of these countries have a vested interest that um, in some cases negative, like Egypt, um, but certainly, you know, for them, stability in Sudan is critical. Um, and so, yeah, I absolutely put my faith more in them, even if there are actors within the African Union, uh, for example, you know, in the past, uh, Egyptian leadership that has um, not had our best interests uh, at heart. But, um, but yeah, I, I put more faith in them than in any other kind of entity. Right on. Well, listen, you're always welcome back. Um, I, I myself would want very much to continue the conversation around Sudan and uh, much of the continent, to be honest. Um, and uh, uh, you and others uh, on this issue are always welcome. And uh, if, if we can ever be in an outlet for you and some sort of resource for more information to be shared, please just let us know. Thank you so much. I um, just appreciate you covering this because we have to make sure that, you know, at least in the independent media, um, that Sudan doesn't that we keep our eyes on Sudan. Yeah, right on. Well, Professor Elamine, thank you very much. Come back again, please, anytime. Thank you. All right. Take care. Bye -bye. Bye. All right, everybody. Big, big respect to Professor Elamine and uh, um, shout out to all the Sudanese folks, you know, uh, on this beautiful, at least in the mid Atlantic region over here in the United States, uh, afternoon, let's all have a, a nice sip of refreshing soda 
and uh, dig into our solidarity of dispersed Africans and uh, look at how refreshing it is. It's just so cooling and, and <laughs> you know, uh, um, anyway. Shout out to the remixers. Appreciate you coming through. Thank you all very much. And uh, um, we'll continue the conversation. Please come back later for Jackie's uh, show, Luke My Nation. And uh, make sure you have the bell rung so you don't miss all of the clips and shows and videos and all kinds of stuff that uh, are coming up. All right. Appreciate you all. Take good care, everybody. Hope you have a good weekend. I'll be back tomorrow, in fact with Dr. Todd Stephen Burroughs. We're going to set it up for warrior class uh, in a discussion of the new news about Alex Haley and Malcolm X. We're going to be talking about Queen and Jenga and that Netflix series and probably a couple other things. So come on back for that as well. All right. Peace, everybody. Like Fred Hampton used to say to you only if you're willing to fight for it. Catch you next time here at I Mix What I Like. Thanks, everybody. I mix what I, I mix, like, what I, I like, mix, what I like. Wait a minute. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. I like what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like.